Hello. Thank you for joining us. My name is Edward Doger and I'm the commissioning editor at the Poetry Translation Centre. We're here to celebrate Rivka Sabatu's new collection, Aulo, Aulo, Aulo. Rivka Sabatu is a poet, academic and human rights activist. She was born in Asmara in 1962 and has been exiled from Eritrea since 1982. She's lived in Ethiopia, France and Italy. During this time, she's published her much admired collection of poems, Aulo, Canto Posi dal Eritrea, as well as pursued an academic career focusing on migrant treatment within Italian culture, and addressed the Italian parliament as a human rights activist representing the network of Eritrean women. In 2011, she published a bilingual edition of Tigrinya Folklore in Tigrinya in Italian, which was the result of a decade of painstaking work to stem the erosion of traditional folkloric culture in the Horn of Africa. Her life, told through the experience of her migration, was the subject of the 2012 documentary Aulo, Roma Postcolonial. Her translator, Andre Nafis Saheli, is a poet, translator and editor. His poetry collection the Promised Land, Poems from Itinerant Life, was published by Penguin in 2017, and is the editor of The Heart of a Stranger, an anthology of exile literature, published by Pushkin Press this year. Andre has translated over 20 titles of fiction, poetry and non-fiction from both the Italian and the French. Just before I hand over to them both, I'd like to say a word or two about the book itself. The book reflects the diversity of Rubka's approach to life, language and literature. Rubka speaks five languages, and this book features work composed in three of them, Tigrinya, Amharic and Italian. There are poems included, and which you'll hear from in a moment, that are poems of direct political intervention, as well as two fables and a selection of early lyric poems. The book features work from across Rivka's life and is a testament to the variousness of her experience, deep human understanding and political engagement. It's also a testament to Andre's tenacious advocacy for this important body of work. Andre has been championing Rivka's poetry in English for 10 years. It was working with the PTC's founder, Sarah Maguire, that Andre first brought Rivka's work to wider attention in the UK through our poetry translation workshops. And it's wonderful to see some of the poems that were first explored there published in this book. The book ends with a beautiful afterword essay by the poet and translator Sasha Dugdale, who's been very instrumental to Ribsko's reception in English, uh, publishing the poem Lampedusa at her time as editor of Modern Poetry and Translation. I'd like to extend our gratitude to Arts Council England, a Pen Translates Award, and funding from the EU's Creative Europe programme, all of which have supported this book and the events that we're putting on now. Tonight's launch event and reading is the first in a series of online events to celebrate this book. Each of the events will focus on a different aspect of Ribka's diverse literary practice and the elements featured in the book itself. Some of the events will be interactive, and if you join us for, for a few of them, you'll be able to put questions to Ribka and Andre themselves. You can find out more details on our website, where you can also purchase this book, and I really hope you do. But there's no better way to convince you to do so than to let you listen to Ribka and Andre themselves. Enjoy. My name is Rukka Subhatu. I was born in Eritrea in 1962. The period was not happy because there were invasion of locusts and the starting of 30 years of war for independence. Also, all moms who assisted my mom announced to the village in Hamburti 
saying a sign of happiness which means come on there is happy house to uh, uh, to participate of this happy event means and they say it as i am a girl three times but for boys is seven ah uh, also there are women who do that mm. uh, this i was saying that uh, a child in Eritrean culture is considered an element of immortality. There are two ways to feel immortal in Eritrean culture. One is through the continuity, generational continuity. The other is uh, if a person do something good in his life like Gandhi has done for India, um, means he is immortal because he is kept in the memory of the country of the people. Um, and I have a happy childhood, I can say. Even if there was war, there was much love, our home was full of guests. You know, guests are considered the messenger of God and you have to give them the best food, the best place to sleep. You can say no, even if it's hard the time. So, our home was always full of people who was coming from everywhere, from different religions. I grew up in an intercultural environment, happy one. The happiness has gone at 17 years old to when I was 17 uh, because I have been arrested and it was really traumatic experience. It was not, it was short time, I mean uh, to compare to the others who died there and the remained many years there, 10 months, but hard. The hard to make it in the evening when they come to take someone to kill because there were no process. It is martial military system. Once I went out, I mean, I was imprisoned because I, I, I say, no, I don't want to marry to you, to an important person. Then when I went out from prison, they again asked me to go, to, that I got a scholarship to go to Moscow to study Marxism, Leninism. I say, I, it doesn't interest me. But I can't say that because if I said I don't want to marry and I finish it in that hell, accused of politics where I was not concerned. So if I say I don't go, it means another trouble. So I had to leave the country. And uh, in this travel, in Italia, in Italy we say there is a proverb Non tutto il male viene per nuocere Not all bad things come just to destroy you You can also wake up from that bad event, which was my case When I was hidden in a countryside, by chance I read Anne Frank's diary And then I say, wow, so I am not the only person who suffers Ah, oh, she is dead and she communicates with me. So, that the mystery of writing. Then I said, I want to be a writer. So, it's, it's fantastic. After I left uh, and I came to Europe, but I want to study. It was hard. In France, they, I was not accepted because I didn't study, I didn't know enough French, so I started to study first by correspondence uh, in Rome, then I came here and uh, it was hard also that because my background, I mean as I was good in maths, my original project was to be an engineer, but after the prison I was upside down and uh, I was not interested and I changed my mind so I want to study literary and languages. I was fascinated the knowledge of languages by the knowledge of languages. It was hard because I had to work part time and I was starting almost from zero. Fortunately, again, Italian proverb they say volere e potere, which means when you want something that is important because you can get it. So I got my degree, my PhD, and now I follow up with other book, Aulo, 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 which means listen to me, I have to say something.
Hello, my name is Andre Nafis Saheli. Um, thank you all for uh, joining our virtual launch. Uh, of course, I'm here today to talk about Ribka Sibatu's Aula, 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 uh, poems from which I translated into English. Um, before I go on to discuss uh, Aula, 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 and Ribka, uh, or rather my relationship with her, I wanted to first thank a few people. Erica Jarns and Ed Dogar at the Poetry Translation Center, uh, as well as, of course, the other members of the team, in particular, Byrne and Nick. I also wanted to thank Claire Pollard at Modern Poetry and Translation, who is just about to publish some poems by Ripka in their summer issue. And, of course, Claire's predecessor uh, at MPT, Sasha Dugdale, who not only published Ripka's work in MPT a few years ago, but also devoted quite a bit of her time to trying to help me find a publisher for this book and in the end ended up writing, of course, the afterword, which you will see at the back of the book. Um, her support really was invaluable. Uh, I think it's also worth noting that uh, Will Forrester at English Pen was very helpful too and we're very grateful for the grant. Um, the reason that I wanted to begin by thanking these people is not just out of gratitude, but also to point out that they were among the very few people to actually recognize the value in Ripka's work. Writing in The Guardian recently, Rachel Long said, and I quote, Black women are invisible, but also hyper-visible when they need you to be, end quote. The day that Rachel Long refers to, at least in my impression, seems to be publishers and arts organizations. And it's more than clear to me now, especially in the light of what is going on politically in much of the West, why it took for me 10 years to bring this book into the light, given that I began translating Ripka's work in 2010. To go back to that period, I thought I would tell you that my discovery of Ripka was absolutely fortuitous. I first came across her work on a blog sometime in 2009. And this blog featured an account of one of Sibatu's visits to a public school somewhere in Italy. I forget where exactly. The post, however, also reproduced a snapshot of uh, Sibatu's prose poem, Virginity, which you'll find in Aula, Aula, Aula. Now, virginity is an autobiographical account of how Ripka had been once forced to pretend that her virginity had been violated in order to avoid entering an arranged marriage at the age of 19. By that time, by the way, she'd already spent a year in prison for refusing to wed an Ethiopian army officer several years older than her. I was instantly struck by how Ripka had managed to balance a fabulistic tone in her narrative with the sleuthy grittiness of an expose. The writing was lyrical, yet economical, and the author's personality was sharply on display. Uncompromising and questioning, but never ever devoid of empathy. Sibatu's work clearly operated on a variety of engrossing levels. First and foremost, perhaps, her opus is deeply inspired by her native country's ancient literary traditions. Secondly, it is a song of exile, I think, one which has seen her live in Ethiopia, France, and now Italy. The truth is that translating Ripka also enabled me to interact with my Italian heritage in a way that I'd never thought possible. Uh, although I mostly grew up in the United Arab Emirates, one of my earliest memories of growing up in Italy was uh, being chased down the streets by neo-Nazis for the simple reason that my older brother, who was a very dark-skinned man, having taken more after my father's side of the family, my father being Iranian, had uh, incited their anger. And I have to say, my other memories aren't exactly that different. Um, so for me, translating Ripka not only introduced me to realities that I hadn't experienced or knew very little about, she actually helped me reconnect with my own roots. Um, I mean, for the simple fact that here was a black woman from Eritrea crafting wonderfully engrossing literature out of a colonial language, uh, the language of the people who had oppressed her country for such a long time. Um, and I thought that it was language that was too resistant to be employed by anyone as outward looking as her. Of course, Ripka, like many other so-called post-colonial Italian writers, uh, has not received as much attention as she deserves. Um, but I, I do sincerely think that that will change with time, as it has changed over the course of the past decade. Um, although, as always, that change occurs far too slowly for, uh, for people who desire it and need it. Um, 
I, I don't want to say much about the poems themselves because I want you to hear from Ribka herself and many of them were written explicitly in such a way as to be immediately understood and pondered on the spot. Um, thanks to the PTC and their efforts, we're able to uh, launch this book um, despite social distancing and I, I think it's great that you'll be able to hear from Ribka directly. Um, Ribka is not just a poet. Uh, she's an academic who has investigated the racist portrayals of immigrants in the Italian media, among other subjects. And she has worked with the very people that you're going to hear about in these poems and fables. Uh, for instance, the fables that uh, you will find in this booklet uh, were actually the result of painstaking years of research by Ripka, collecting these uh, gems of Eritrean oral literature from the village elders whom she talks about so eloquently in these fables. So thank you very much for joining us. I hope you'll enjoy the readings and it's, it's been a true pleasure not just to work with the PTC but to be able to carry on, not just carrying on a dialogue with Ripka but to continue sharing her work. I'm really very humbled by that and um, I, I hope you'll enjoy it. Thank you very much. Uh, the word sycamore in my poems, from my point of view, are uh, key words because um, sycamore in ancient Eritrea was the parliament of every village. People were gathering under the sycamore to discuss of the country situation, to choose their their um, mm, mm, in the municip like the municipality or pre their president and so on locally speaking and uh, um, there was feasts there was sorrows under the sycamore was happening like the agora in greek uh, ancient greek so but now the sycamore doesn't exist anymore because just one man decide for all Eritreans. So, it's nostalgic. Al sicomoro. Passati amari anni, desilio e umiliazioni, baciai prostrata amberti la terra dei miei avi che mi portarono per mano al sicomoro. Sentì discorsi rimati ai vivi e ai morti, leggi e compromessi. Poi svanirono dietro il maestoso sicomoro, recitando indicibili aulò, recenti canti pianti e del lontano passato. Era settembre, tornando sola e triste, dalle case e chiese sentì il profumo di incenso e canti di capodanno. Da lontano aspetta il richiamo del sicomoro. L'oasi. Lungo il viaggio, alla fontana del canto, nonno sicomoro mi cullò coi profumati cori secolari che fecero crescere i miei avi. Protetta dal sicomoro, canta storie del passato mistero, nel cammino e nell'esilio, canto l'immensità nell'oasi della scrittura. Him to the sycamore tree. After years of bitter exile and humiliation, I knelt to kiss Himberti, the land of my ancestors, who led me by the hand all the way to the sycamore. There, I heard people address the living and dead in rhyme, heard laws and compromises too. Then they vanished behind the stately sycamore, reciting unspeakable aulaws, howling songs of the present and distant past. It was September, and winding my way, sad and lonesome, among houses and churches, I smelt the fragrance of incense and heard the New Year's songs. Now, from afar, I wait for the call of the sycamore tree, when I see my reflection in the face of humanity. I feel great shame at being alive.
how low, how low, how low. In Eritrean culture, uh, means when you are gathered in a big event and you want to say something to the public, uh, it's a way to ask a permission. Saying Aulo, Aulo, Aulo means give me the permission. I want to say my opinion, but in rhyme. This is traditional, one of the highest uh, poetical uh, expression of uh, uh, in the Horn of Africa, we can say, even in Ethiopia, it's more or less the same. Um, but the person who asks um, the permission to say his opinion normally are men. Exceptionally, women can also say, but normally is for women deserve this expression. Means that you are someone. Uh, that you have done something good for the um, community or you have shown heroic action like in ancient times to kill an elephant or a lion means heroic uh, attitude so you can publicly express your opinion and normally the oldest person who is present in the event give you the permission or not give you if they say they keep quiet means you don't have the permission, you don't deserve it. But if the answer, especially the oldest person in the community, answer saying habo 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 means you can talk, say what we are going to listen to you. And to the public when say habo habo, it means uh, keep quiet who is dancing, chatting and so on, has to keep quiet to listen the man who uh, want to say his opinion in right. A Lampedusa. Il 3 ottobre a Lampedusa è arrivato un barcone con 518 persone. Nella notte fonda dallo Zatterone hanno visto le luci della terra promessa. Credendo finita la loro sofferenza e un viaggio pieno di insidia, in coro, a gran voce, hanno dato Maria. Donne e uomini, adulti e bambini, malati e sani, ha incantato inni aspettando i soccorsi delle due navi. Sentita <totipo> uie, ma Maria mille, avai wadiqe, senti un mo, senti un mo, senti un mo, senti un mo, senti Chiamando il tuo nome non mi sono vergognato, mi sono appellato a Maria e non sono caduto. Il tuo nome è stato il mio cibo di viaggio ed eccoti l'eco del mio riconoscimento. Canto ad alta voce per ringraziarti. All'improvviso comincia a riempirsi d'acqua il barcone. Per dare l'allarme si accendono e si spengono le luci rosse, si accendono e si spengono le lampadine. Ma nell'isola, come prima, tutto tace. Intanto l'acqua sale aumentando il terrore di affondare. Per dare un preoccupante segnale si brucia una tela e divampano le fiamme. Le persone intorno urlando scappano dal fuoco e capovolgono il barcone. Tutti. Tutti nel gelido mare si inizia la lotta tra la vita e la morte. Chi sa muoversi in acqua soccorre, chi annega lasciando messaggi da mandare nel proprio paese, chi consegna ai vivi il suo nome e paese d'origine prima di morire. Johanna, 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 grida Mebrato un disperato tra i cadaveri che galleggiano. Nel freddo mare, in solitudine e un estremo gesto d'amore, Johanna, tra i pesci e nel silenzio, ha consegnato al mondo il suo figlio. Ma a Lampedusa nessuno ha sentito i sette trilli eritrei di benvenuto. Perché Johanna è morta dopo una lotta sovrumana, il suo bumbo è morto, 
senza vedere la luce del giorno. È morto prima di emettere il suo primo respiro. Un neonato è morto soffocato dal mare salato. Il bimbo è nato ed è morto subito, col cordone attaccato. Una donna è morta mentre partoriva. Sono morte 368 persone. Sono morti 357 eritrei. Il 3 ottobre 2013, nel cuore del Mediterraneo, a 800 metri dell'isola dei conigli, si è consumata una tragedia del popolo eritreo. Una delle tragedie del popolo eritreo che continua anche adesso in Libia, in Sudan, dappertutto in Eritrea, col Covid rischia di morire anche adesso. Lampedusa. On October 3rd, a barge carrying 518 people arrived in Lampedusa. Having survived the brutal dictatorship and a journey full of pitfalls, they stood atop their raft in the dead of night and saw the lights of the promised land, believing their suffering had reached an end. They raised the chorus and praised the Virgin Mary. While waiting for those ships to rescue them, men and women, children and grown-ups, the sick and the healthy began to sing hymns. I wasn't ashamed when I called out your name. I called out to Mary and didn't fall. Your name sustained me throughout my journey. And here is the grateful echo of the song I raised to thank thee. Suddenly, the raft started filling with water. They started flashing red lights to sound the alarm, switched their lanterns on and off. Alas, all was quiet on the island. Meanwhile, the water rose, stoking fears the ship would sink. To send a distress call, they set a sail on fire, and as the flames began to spread, some frightened people jumped overboard and tipped the boat over. They were all adrift in the freezing sea. Amidst that storm, some died right away. Some beat the odds and cheated death. Some who could swim tried to be of help. Some drowned using their last breath to send messages back to their native land. Some called out their names and countries of origin before succumbing to their fate. Among the floating corpses, Mebrahtom raised a desperate cry, Johanna, Johanna, Johanna. But Johanna didn't answer. All alone and in an extreme act of love, she brought her son into the world, birthing him into the fish-filled sea. Yet nobody in Lampedusa heard the seven ululations welcoming his birth. Because after a superhuman struggle, Johanna died alongside her son, who never saw the light of day and perished without even drawing his breath. A baby died, drowned in the salty sea. The baby was born and died with its umbilical cord still unsevered. A woman died while giving birth. 368 people died. 357 Eritreans died. On October 3rd, 3,000 feet from Rabbit Island, in the heart of the Mediterranean, a tragedy struck the Eritrean people, one of many they had endured. When I was young, I used to write uh, uh, poems in Amharic, and now I'm back. Aboya Boisker, it is the addressed to the Prime Minister, Ethiopian Prime Minister, the winner of the Nobel for Peace. Aboya Boisker. የኢትዮጵያ ህዝብ በአንድነት ፍትህ 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 ብሎ ተነስተሳለ አቢ በይቅርታ አንታረቅ በመፋቀር እንደ መር የሚለው መፈክር ይዞ በቃ አለ ህዝቡ ቃሉና አምሎ አቦ ያቦይ ማለት ቱቶ 
አቢ ያቢ ማለት እንደጀመር አቢ ኢሱ ኢሱ ብሎ ነገር አብላሽ አቦ ያቦ ይስቀረ አብይና አብይን ተክቶ በያረድ ዝማሬ የተቀኘ የሰላምና ፍቅር ተስፋ ነግሶ በዳዊት በገና ታጅቦ ወደ ሰሜን እንዲዛልቅ ከሊቅ እስከ ደቂቅ ሲተባበቅ አቢ ኢሱ ኢሱ ያለ ኖቤሉን ሲያካፍል በመደነቅ እንዴት መልአክና ሰይጣን ተፋቀሩ ስነ ህዝቡ መፈናቀል አብ የክርስቲያናት መስጊዶች መቃጠል ባንኮች መዘረፍ ጀነራሎች መገደል ተጀመረ ይሄ ማኖት አባዶች ጤዛ ለሰው ድንጋይ ተንተርሶ የአንድነት ታሪክ በደማቸው ጽፎ ባቆዩት ሀገር የሞተው ሲገንዙ ያዘነው ሲያጽናኑ በገጀራ መቆረጥ በጥይት መገደል ጀመሩ ልጆቻቸው በፎቅ መወርወር ተገድለው መዘቀዘቅ በእስር መማቀቅ ቀጠሉ አቦ ያቦ ይባል እንደነበር አቢ ያቢ ማለትም እንዳይቀር እንዳጼት ይድሮስ አጼ ምንልክ ስም ለታሪክ እንዲቀር ሰው ሆነ አቢ ሰው የሆነ መሪ በተፈለቀበት This next poem is entitled Now No One Sings Hosannas an open letter The Ethiopian people stirred and raised a loud cry Justice justice and a bee answered them We must forgive and come together in the name of love And so his motto won the people's trust And instead of chanting a boy a boy they began to sing a bee a bee But unfortunately a bee exalting isu isu derailed the whole process when the people swapped a boy a boy for a bee a bee hope soared for new and lasting peace hymns were sung and all waited for the words of saint yared to carry north in tune with king david's harp then we saw a bee publicly cheer isu wisu and we knew he betrayed his nobel prize and reeled how can angels and demons be friends Next, his men started breaking up crowds, burning the mosques and churches of our ancestors, who'd written the country's history in their blood, who'd sated their thirst with dew and used stones as pillows. Now machetes slit the mourners' throats, who dared to wrap the dead, and the young fall from prison windows or rot away. Now no one sings hosannas to a boy, and perhaps the same fate awaits abi to find your rightful place in history you must keep your word and like king menelik and tewodros be worthy of this great people you lead maya beba on the hill of azhaz lived the girl from asmara Alas, my beautiful Abeba, so poised and slender. Abeba, a flower that rhymes like coal rhymes around an eye. So that the world may know, while they were digging her grave, cloaked in mystery and death, she wove an agilgel basket and sent it the void of hambasha bread. On an indelible night, they took her from me in handcuffs. Every day I feel her presence, but every but i see her everywhere in the dark she never wants to leave me so bring me my abebaz algegel perhaps it holds the answer the key to those handcuffs that now bite into me my abebaz algegel bears a single inscription a memento for my loved ones my friend in prison a flower who faded before she bloomed ابو بي 
ابوبي غلاس مرا اب حس حس سفيرا ايو ابوك چن زربا اخلو بعقن كم عين كحلت حدش مان ملكع مستر موت حزيلا غحسا نا خواتولا نا علم تاويلا سددت اغلغل حنباشا ديبلا ليت مدري اب غودناي هو مقحت منزعت ابوبي مالا سب هل ميك اتر اتر تقد فني بيني كاب ابيت كابايم فلاي حيزات اللامل سحتو تاتي ما ذكرتا ان ولدي تبلا قلقل ابو بيا مصلي نايتا كي عم ببت دعربا ابو ما تاثرتي ديديكيتد تو ابابا ماي بريزن friend